So my name is Joe Dobster and I live here in Huntsville. I'm a blacksmith and a woodworker and a retired educator and I, a member of um, Blacksmith Organization of Arkansas. I'm a steward of the Northwest chapter of BOA and uh, I'm glad you're here today. I'm gonna talk about the basics of blacksmithing tools and some techniques and uh, show you some things I've made and, and uh, let's get started. I like to start uh, my coal fire. This is coal. Uh, the raw chunks look like this. After they've been through a fire, they kind of break down into a coke, which is much lighter and uh, a lot of the impurities are burned off. So as I'm working, you'll see me rake uh, raw coal in and you keep bringing in fresh coal as you go. I like to start my fires with uh, some wood shavings or wood chips out of out of my wood shop and this is a little forge just a simple forge it's got a a uh, a blower that i'll crank back here and the air comes down through the blower and up through this part which is called the twir it has a way to dump the the waste out of, out of the bottom of it and you cap it off and the air from the blower is fed to the forge. <laughs> so I'll introduce some of the coke from my, my previous fire and it'll catch a little quicker than the raw coal. We'll get a fire going here pretty quick. Of course, this is an anvil. Um, the horn of the anvil and the table or primary working surface. The square hole is called a, a hardy hole and it accepts uh, different tools and appliances. Some of these down below are, are hardy tools. The uh, probably the primary hardy tool is called a hardy cutoff. It's just a uh, relatively sharpened appliance or device that fits in the hardy hole, and you use it to to cut pieces to length. got a, a little piece of rebar. I think I will make a simple S hook, something like this today, and uh, show you how you can take just, I, I work with predominantly recycled materials. I'm pretty frugal. Um, and I, I just, I like making do with, the, with what I have. I think it's in the spirit of the, uh, the Ozarks and the pioneers uh, from Shallow Museum. I'm sure you, you get that. And I, I love that. So I'll take an old piece of rebar that's been multi-use. I think I've used it as a garden stake and lots of other things, but I'll take a piece of that and stick it in the fire. There are a number of devices or tools that are used to to grip the material. Diff these are tongs and different jaw shapes and sizes are utilized to grip the material based on the diameter or size of the material you're working with. and whether or not you need to work around bulges in the material like bolt heads. This is a set of bolt head tongs. But these are all tongs. I have lots of them. Many of them I've made myself and others I've received through our trade item. The blacksmith group has a trade item each month. Whoever hosts the meeting determines what the trade item will be. And many times the trade item is a set of tongs. Our next meeting it will be a set of tongs. But the so <coughs> Use set of tongs to put the material in the in the fire. So I burned burn my pinky. <laughs> One of the mistakes that beginning smiths make is they stick their material down in the bottom of the fire. Well, all the heat's above you, your material. So I like to put my material in the middle of the fire, work the coals around it, and kind of bed it down, and then gradually build it in.
There are various hammers, uh, lots of different styles of hammers. That's a uh, cross peen. And this is referred to as a ball peen, uh, different sizes and different weights. There's some other hammers here you might uh, take a look at. And, uh, various sizes and just what are you trying to do? And you may need a heavier hammer, you need a, you need a lighter hammer. Sometimes you need to strike multiple strikes quickly. In this case, I would like a, a lighter hammer. Sometimes you really need a wax stuff. And, um, but if you're a small guy like me, bigger hammers will wear you out. So that's uh, the hammer to your need and your size. The height of the anvil is, is uh, variable to suit the, the smith. So what we got now is a working heat, a good bright heat. Now if I go much farther than that on the end, and you can see the color changes as it cools down, as it down it turns from yellow to orange to red and fades as the color uh, of the heat. Uh, if, if the heat, if you just lose heat, the color changes. So um, you got to be careful to not heat too far. You see how I pack that down? <laughs> I like to dead my coals. So, um, one of my mentors um, says, think twice and strike once. It's kind of like the carpenter ad adage, measure twice and cut once. Think, think twice and strike once. So you, except that I'm trying to talk while I'm working, I'm thinking about where I gotta go and what I'm gonna do. So I kind of arrange my tools as I need them. And I think about my end product, where I wanna go with this. What I'm going to do to start with is called drawing out. And I will lengthen this piece of metal and reduce it in diameter, but I'll do it in a square cross section because it's easier to draw out in a square cross section than it is round. And I'll go from round to square and then back to round as the process goes. Turn it 90 to work that cross section and begin to get a general taper, a square taper. And I'm looking for bulges, try to keep a kind of a uniform taper. I'm a little fat right here. I'll spend the next little bit of time and you can see I'm losing heat. I still got a little heat. If I work it beyond my heat, I begin to develop extra stresses in the middle, in the metal, before I go back to the fire, I like to kind of straighten things up a little bit, not, not quite where I want to be, but you can see I've taken it from, from round to square, I go back to the fire, bed it in, bring in a few raw coal chunks, bed it down, get the heat up. Working with the coal, there are a lot of impurities in it, dirt and crud and shale, whatever's in the vein of coal, and it produces a waste product that kind of gloms together, and that's called um, clinker. And so I have a clinker bucket there. I have trouble with uh, holding my hammer with a glove on, and I don't have the tactile uh, feeling I'll hammer with a glove, but sometimes, sure, I'll wear gloves. I've got now, okay. I've just about gone too far. I'm gonna go too far and show you what happens when you get your metal too hot. Can you see those sparkles? You're burning your metal up when you when you get those those little uh, sparklers. Well. Anyway, so you can see the surface of the metal is pretty rough because I was burning the metal up while I was jabbering. But you can clean that off. You clean it back up and keep on trucking.
if you keep your uh, anvil face clean, then you don't dimple the bottom side of your material with the crud that accumulates on your on your uh, table, your anvil bed. So I blow it off from time to time. That's just kind of a, a, a quirk. Not too many people do it, but I, I like to keep the face of my anvil clean. I think of this anvil as being in the family, not owned by me. It's our family anvil, uh, the Bohannon family on at Rock House, out of uh, on the Carroll Madison County line on Kings River. Uh, they homesteaded in the 1800s, and uh, this anvil probably is Civil War period, if not before. It's a mouse hole. And my friend Bob Patrick helped me recondition it. It was in pretty rough shape. And I'm uh, beholden to him for being a major part of getting me started. Okay, I've gone from round to about the size of square taper that I want. And now, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to go to from square back to round, and I'll show you why. Now switch hammers, because what I want to do next is uh, some lighter weight, more rapid striking. Our group, uh, BOA, Blacksmith Organization of Arkansas, meets typically the second Saturday of each month, and you can contact me through Shiloh, I guess, if you want to know more about that. So now I'm going to turn that square into an octagon by striking on the, the corners. You take a square and knock the corners off, it turns into an octagon. And then I'll take that octagon and knock those corners off and just make a round out of it. Round the square to back to back to round. Now then, so it's got a pretty good taper. If I wanted to really make that nice and smooth, uh, this uh, device here, this little cone mandrel that I made, I made it. I wanted it really nice and smooth. So when I forged it, then I did quite a bit of file work draw filing and dressing that tapered shape. In this case, I don't necessarily need that. For a decorative piece like this, you kind of want to have some hammer strikes that make it look, I mean, it is natural, it's handmade. So, I'm gonna turn the little elephant snout on, uh, on this piece. I call it an elephant snout. I need a good pair of scrolling tongs, but in the interim, I took a pair of uh, needle nose pliers and ground the edges off, uh, and that will help me make a nice smooth um, bend in the metal without distorting the edges. <coughs> So, I got that like I want it. Now then. I'll put another device up here in my party hole. This is just a fixture to help me make the the hook and make it be uh, similar in size on both ends. You can do the same thing on the horn of your anvil, but it's a little easier to get them consistent if you have a, a fixture device. And the, the square hole in the anvil keeps it from twisting around. And it, it's just a real quick, handy device. I don't know when the first anvil was made, but they're old. Pretty cool concept. Now, I don't want to distort my little elephant snout, 
So I'm gonna cool that off. I may not quite have enough. I'm going to I'm gonna lose it. Put it down here. Don't have quite enough heat, so I could stop right there if I wanted to. But I think I'll go on around a little bit. I lost the heat, so I gotta go back and get a little more. Um, depending on what you wanna, whether you're just cooling or actually quenching, I have a bucket of oil as well, and I use that for blades or tools that, um, when you when you quench metal at a particular color, which represents a uh, temperature heat, um, you kind of freeze the molecular structure of the material at that point. Um, and essentially what it does then, it, it, it can make, depending on the carbon content of the metal, rebar doesn't have a lot of carbon, but it's pretty, it's a tough material, so it's got some, more so than mild steel. But uh, tool steels like spring steel, they have a very high carbon content. And if you quench, I like to quench in oil for tool steel, if you quench at a, a high color heat, it freezes that material molecular structure. It makes it really, really hard, but it also makes it very brittle. So then you have to reheat and bring up to a different color temperature um, and uh, temper. Um, so there's a balancing act, and if you temper by fire color, uh, it's more of a um, art than science. But uh, in the knife making industry, they do it by high uh, accuracy gauges and, and uh, the molecular structure of the steel is, you know. I work with recycled materials and use old style ways. But I do have a, a little countertop oven and I use that for tempering as well. So I'll, I'll do my quenching on blades and things like that and then draw temper in, uh, in the other. And I like that kind of that shape where my the shaft of my hook is essentially in the center of the of the um, hook there it'll it'll hang straight. Okay, so that's that's one of the hooks, essentially. They're all a little different. And now I wanna show you how to make this this twist, which is decorative, but uh, it just, it's pretty cool. So I'll make, show you how to make that twist. Hmm, might should have made that before I made the hook, but we'll, we'll figure out a way to get around it. <clears throat> so work on the other end. Introduce more raw coal. Bend my coal down. Okay, I need a set of tongs that will reach around that. Mm, let's see. I don't think that'll do it. Nope. Not exactly what I want, but you've really got to have a good grip on your material. If you if you don't, and you strike a little wonky, it'll fly out of your tongs and slap you in the face. Ask me how I know that. So having a good grip on the material is kind of paramount. It's good to have a rake to Work your coal and the fuel. You can also use uh, charcoal uh, for some uh, operations. Charcoal is maybe a better fuel than coal. Um, primarily, you just need uh, air, a fuel, and some method of getting that air and fuel and heat together to have fire. Ooh talking and getting way too hot. See, see the sparks? <laughs> too hot. <laughs> okay.
because the material is losing its heat, it doesn't dimple as easily and it's easier to get a, a flatter finished surface as the material cools. But if you work it too much, you're building in extra stresses. So it's a trade off between surface finish and uh, stresses built up in the material. Lots of different tools. Uh, this is a bending fork. If I want to take material and, and bend it, I, I've got a, uh, a very strong bending fork. Um, if I want a vertical way to utilize a rounding surface, that's pretty handy. It also doubles up as a, as a, a rivet head, uh, a way to set a, a rivet head down in here so that you don't distort the rivet when you uh, make a rivet. So that's a double tool. This tool is handy for creating a 90 degree bend. You can do the same thing here at the, this part of the anvil, but uh, can also be accomplished here with that tool. That's a, a nice bending fixture. This is a fullering tool. If I want to stretch material out to great length, um, you can put a series of dimples on the underside of your material along the length and it's a quick way of drawing material out. It's called a fullering tool. You can do the same thing on the edge of your anvil or here, but that's pretty handy. Uh, different size and types of drifts. If you're going to make a, a hammer or ax or striking tool and you need to create an eye in the metal, uh, you can drive um, that forming die in there. Another, all of these are made out of recycled materials. Um, sucker rod or tie rod ends. Just a little bolster here to get the material up off the, uh, sometimes you're working on something that has a head or a part that you don't want to damage on your anvil, but you need to work the shaft of it. So this just sticks it up above the anvil surface a little bit. Uh, this is another type of fuller that has a, a um, if I strike, put my material in here and strike it, it's going to leave a bulge and I use this for making chisels and gouges to create what's called a nut. Now, this is a very small one, but that little gap, can you see that? Right in there. Can you see the gap? So there's a gap on both sides and that gap fills with the material. It squishes it around it. Um, and I'll show you how that works with another piece later on. Um, just different, different tools, uh, for different functions and you, you develop them or create them as needed. The fragile part of this piece is that little elephant nose and you see that I stick it, keep it out of fire because I don't want it to get caught or damaged. But the rest of the shaft I want to I want to work on so I got it fully involved. You can watch your fire and kind of see where the metal's at because there's a little dark spot. As the color of the fire down deep changes and it gets bright down there, well I know then that, that shaft that I want to work on is getting bright in color. No kidding. <laughs> Alright, one more heat to get what I want. I think I'll make this, rather than an S-hook like this one, I think I'll make this one. Just a, uh, a hook to drive in the wall.
I can go to a grinder and quickly make a point on this to drive in the, the wall, but you know, old timers didn't have, if they had a grinder, it was hand crank, but the more work you can do at the anvil, the less you need other tools. Okay, so now, took that old piece of rebar and turned it into something pretty cool looking. I'm gonna bend this a little bit and make a 90 that'll drive in the wall. But in the meantime, I wanna put a twist here, similar to this one. And if the edges of the twist are nice and sharp, it makes a pretty twist. <laughs> so there's some aesthetic aspect to it, at least the way I look at it. It's prettier if it's got a nice crisp angle and a twist with, uh, you go to a hardware store and buy a square rod, it's kind of rounded from the manufacturing process. But you can tell a forged twist from something that's just uh, cold twisted by some of the little details and good sharp corners are signs of a forged twist. So I'll <clears throat> come out of the forge with this when it heats, and I'll come to the anvil. This is a leg vise or post vise. Um, um, they go way back. It probably is in the same era as that uh, anvil. It came from the, the same farmstead, uh, the Bohannon Farm Place. And uh, I cracked walnuts with this when I was five or six years old. But what I'll do is I'll bring that material out of the fire. I'm gonna gauge it for its relative size. And then I'll take a, this is just a, I welded a rod onto this old uh, wrench to uh, grab the material and twist it. Okay, so that's, I got my twisting wrench ready. I got my vise about the size I need and uh, trying to get a good heat. We'll put a twist in there. <laughs> So my color of my fire looks really hot. Sure enough, I'm, I got a hot, hot material. So, think what I'm gonna be. Think twice. In this case, I'm not striking, but I'm twisting. I'm just looking for a kind of a pleasant twist. Straighten it up a bit. Oh, that's not too bad. Not too bad. I misplaced my fine wire brush this morning. This course will work. Okay. Well, stay along. Try to remember to put my tools back where I need them. Okay, so now that I'll bend, I'll bend this area in a 90 so that it can be driven in the wall and used as a, a wall hook. And we'll have a completed, nearly completed. I'll put a little finish on it too here in just a second. One of the squarest parts of my anvil is right here. So I'll work from the opposite side. You'll get to see the better side of it. Dimple my, I got a little bit of a hook there that I'm not happy about. 
I don't have my wood mallet with me, but I don't want to, yeah, that worked. Okay, a little bit of a hook that I don't want. So you can see how my hook is not in line with my spike. So I'll just twist it. So, can you does it show very well? There. Now, one more thing to do. Still unhappy with that hook. Um, scrub the heck out of it. All the crud off of it. By the way, in a blacksmith shop, it doesn't look hot, but you can assume if it's metal, and it's in a blacksmith shop, it's probably hot. So now then, yeah, it's still pretty hot. I take candle wax and um, use it for a, a finish that helps keep rust from developing. And it smells nice too. This one does. There we go, we got a little drip going on now. Got a little paintbrush that I typically use, but I misplaced that this morning. Doesn't look it, but you assume that it's hot. Okay, so it's, yeah, it just barely melted there, so it's still pretty warm. But if you if you put it on too hot, it just heats it right off, and it won't. Won't be any good, but you want it hot enough to just flow. So it's cool off enough, I can just cool it to handle. You see how the water beads up? That's what the wax does. Okay, so. So now then I could drive that in a post if I wanted to and use it as a hook for farm tools or, or I could give it away as a gift. I went to a bull meeting. I was invited to a blacksmith organization of Arkansas meeting. And one of the members kind of took me under his wing and uh, I told him I had a project and I wanted to make a bull carving ads uh, like his I'd seen at a bull meeting. And so he said, okay, come to the next meeting and we'll make one. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, no. He said, yeah. So I had took my ball peen hammer and the first one turned to mush. So I thought, well, that's the end of being a blacksmith. I can... Anyway, he pulled out of his coat pocket another ball peen. I thought, wow, this guy invited me to uh, a bull meeting. And not only did he gamble that I might come, but he also brought a spare ball peen hammer because he knew I wanted to make an ads like his. Well, it turns out that one turned out to be mush too. Well, he reached in his other pocket and pulled another ball peen hammer and it turned out to be this one. That was the very first thing I made and it's a um, a wonderful little ball, ball peen bowl carving as for the woodworking I do. 
I mentioned Bob Patrick earlier, a mentor, and um, I had seen uh, some photographs of Northwest Coast Indian style uh, carving as the folks that make the totems and the canoes. And uh, I wanted to make one of those uh, and my, my friend Bob Patrick helped me and then I made, created the, the handle and the uh, wrapping. And this was a, a, a fork of a tree, there's a tree branch. And that's another ads that I use. Uh, probably the first knife that I made was this one, um, made from a horseshoe rasp. You can see the, the coarse side and the fine side of a horseshoe rasp. Um, one of my, my first knives. Uh, recently, I needed, I did built a dining table for my daughter and son-in-law, and it had uh, a lot of mortises, which are square holes, and I needed a uh, tool, a corner chisel, to quickly rough out the square corners of the mortises, and uh, uh, being a blacksmith, I quickly went out and, and did a little forge work. She did here, I welded, not a forge weld, but a arc weld, but uh, when you have a little bit of knowledge, you can take the simple materials, rebar and a piece of angle iron. Uh, I did quench and harden this, by the way, but uh, works perfectly. Uh, I mentioned earlier before we got on camera that this knife was made by my Uncle Bud, and given to my mother, and then passed on down to me. Uh, he spent many, many hours when the forge, and, uh, when the uh, anvil and uh, leg vice were in his possession, uh, doing uh, knife work. He was a uh, uh, paraplegic and uh, loved doing metal work, making knives. Very well done, I think, from uh, uh, typically crosscut saw blades was his preferred material. Um, our trade items often will be something like a, a candle holder. So this was a set of calla leaves candle holder set that I made. Uh, I think we, I traded off a single, but I made a set that, that I've kept and, and then another candle holder and an old kind of uh, colonial style. The second tool that I made was this um, gouge and I used a nut for a nut. This is called a nut and what it does the shank on this is tapered. It gets broader this way. So as you drive your material, the nut keeps the gouge from driving up into the handle. This was the second tool I made after the full carving ads. And then I began to make other tools. So um, to make, what did I do with that gouge? Oh, right here. To make um, the nut, on a gouge, you heat this hot and form the material like that. And it depresses the material on either side of the nut, but it leaves that bolstered area that in effect keeps the handle, the gouge from driving on up into your handle. Otherwise, it just keep bang, 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 bang. The more you hammer on it, uh, you, you break your handle. So. That's what uh, this, this tool is for. Okay, so these, uh, these gouges were made for a Queen Anne style um, low board chest that I made. Um, and I, I, perhaps we'll all show you a picture or we'll go and take a picture of that. But it's, a, it's got a sun uh, relief carved into the face of one of the drawers and I needed two different sweeps of gouge. You can tell that they're a little bit different uh, radius. I needed both of those. And then I needed what's called a back bent gouge, which is bent backwards to create the rays of the sun on the, on the, the um, Queen Anne piece of furniture. And, and so in an, uh, about two hours time, I had the chisels made to create the carving. Um, similarly, there I've got a Celtic cabinet that I've got in the house and I made these two chip carving knives from coil spring and uh, shucks, I can't think what I made that, probably leaf spring. 
But just in a, in a few hours time, probably less than a few hours, you make the tools you need to do the job at hand. Um, this is a scorp for bowl carving or chair seat carving. Uh, sometimes the trade item will be something made from a railroad spike or something made from um, horseshoe or whatever. Uh, anyway, this is a, uh, a little tomahawk from a horseshoe, I mean a uh, railroad spike. Hoof pick to dig the dirt out of a horse's hoof. Different hook knives for uh, spoon making, we'll show that in a little bit. Um, different stake turners. See the nice crisp corners on that twist, you know it was hand forged. This one is yet to be completed. I have a friend with a power hammer to take a railroad spike and draw that out. A little more work than I'd want to do by hand, but he has a, a power hammer and boom, 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 boom. So that'll be a stake turner at some point in time. Uh, just different uh, decorative things that I've made.